you will look at look at something and say, oh, that's like Rembrandt. Or you will say, Rembrandt made me feel like that. Now, how is he going to change us and what exactly is he going to change us with? Well, that's what we're going to find out. But first of all, Rembrandt, for all of us, is a brother. For light is like a living thing, it's infinitely versatile. And now it dazzles, now merely glows. It can caress, it can strike, it can reveal or conceal. Opposed to shadow, it creates our expectation of the world before we touch it. Light is of the essence of Western art. It is inseparable from the moment. And the timelessness of Western art is the moment prolonged into eternity while the Oriental annihilates the moment to reach infinity. We are going to see a number of moments when the flux of light is held still by the miracle of art, when light is let fall not by chance, but by an artist who in his turn as creator says, let there be light. And of this artist it has been written, Rembrandt van Rijn discovered that light which, resting humble figures from the darkness, invests them with eternity. It's a light that never was in the world of reality. It's a spiritual thing, a radiance that transforms everything that it touches, and it touches everything. The bare boards of doors and windows and pots and pans, cloths, draperies, and above all, it touches flesh. It seeks out the nooks and the crannies of all the mundane things among which we live, and discovers in them such an importance but after seeing Rembrandt's works, we are constantly impelled to re-examine the real world, the world of the senses. And that, I suppose, is one of the primary functions of art. Because art, too, is an experience, just like anything in the world around us is an experience. And after experiencing great art, we are changed. Because we are the sum of our experiences, that's all we're left with in the end the total of our experiences and our reaction to them. That's how we change. Now, the way great art changes us is very mysterious, but it does change us. And it sends us back to nature in some mysterious way different. So that within the next half hour, you will be changed even in some little way by this man Rembrandt. So that sometime perhaps you will look at, look at something and say, oh, that's like Rembrandt. Or you will say, Rembrandt made me feel like that. Now, how is he going to change us, and what exactly is he going to change us with? Well, that's what we're going to find out. But first of all, Rembrandt, for all of us, is a brother. Rembrandt stands beside us, and we can reach out and touch him. That's the wonderful thing about it. Now, the others in this league, this league of giants, don't do that. Michelangelo, for instance, brings us up to those rarefied heights with him where we can hardly breathe. And Leonardo, well, Leonardo, looking at his art is, is like looking at a, a sleeping face and wondering what dream lies behind it. But Rembrandt is affection. He paints with affection. And I remember once Jack Butler Yeats saying to me, there's only one way to paint, and that's with affection. Rembrandt would have liked that. Well, now, let's go back. And let's go to the boy who was father of the man that Rembrandt became. To this young boy in Leiden who goes to the university at the age of 14, he's out again at 15, and then he goes and studies for a brief while, a little later, at the capital at Amsterdam. And then he comes back to Leiden again, to his hometown, and this boy is a young master already. And what a talent this boy has. What a wonderful talent he has. He paints with such capacity that he takes the sight out of your eyes. He really does. Just look at this. He's a real pro. And he's a young man with drama in him, as you can see here. See the way he silhouettes that easel so that it stands on its three legs like some animate object. He really takes that easel and he hammers it into your eye. That's more in the picture than the boy himself. And it's so simple. You know, just standing there on its three legs, but then simple things are very hard to explain. And sometimes they're hard to see. Well, now, the light that silhouettes this easel is painted on the wall. Do you see it there behind the easel? You can see it teeming on the wall there, so that you can feel it as you pass by. You can really feel it there, the light. And this boy is really learning to make light work for him. 
So much so that in this blank space, the pellet, you see the pellet behind there, it's perfectly recessed and hangs solidly on the wall, and that's a very diff difficult thing to do. Just recess it backly so that it will do just that. Now look at the wonderful little figure with the great black hat, dressed up. Rembrandt loved dressing up himself and his models. And that face, that little face, is no bigger than your thumbnail. It's smaller than your thumbnail. But already it's painted with breath, with an air of mastery. And, you know, you can tell that this is a picture he painted for himself, for fun. It's not a formal commission. He sets the stage here and he puts himself on it. And what a wonderful thing it must be to be a great artist, to be able to set your stage, to be able to say within the four walls of this frame, I am king, I am master. I can create a world and I can draw you into it. I can create, in fact, like God. And the artist can and does. And to do this, he has only to struggle with one thing with himself. And Rembrandt, more than any other, turns his thoughts inward and makes great art out of himself. So that his art appears not the mirror of his thoughts. It appears to be the very movement of his thoughts. I remember there was one artist who said that so much is lost between the head and the hand. In Rembrandt, it seems there's nothing lost. And maybe it's this that made a German artist, Max Lieberman, say, when I see Franz Hald, I want to start painting. When I see Rembrandt, I want to stop. Now, each artist handles paint in his own way. It's the most personal thing, like a signature. And Rembrandt handles paint most wonderfully. I want you to look at it here. It's thick, it's juicy, it's rich, it's got the consistency of, oh, whipped cream. And he moves it around so that it has a beauty that is, goes beyond merely what it represents. And talking about signatures, when you see paint like this, you don't need a signature. This is Rembrandt. Well, now, let's look at that little face again. It's a mood, distant, away from us, shadowed by the brim, the two eyes shadowed. Well, now, Rembrandt looked at his own face many times. So let's look at this brilliant young master practicing his scales, searching around for means of expression as he starts to hit the top now here in his hometown in Leiden, the great future coming up. Well, here it is a pent-up expression. Look at that, isn't it marvelous? Uh, a half-dark face with the hair flying out like an explosion, as if it were electrified, like rays of lightning. It's, it's marvelous. And there's a dramatic contrast of light and shade here, of, of dark and bright, which reminds you, in a little way, of Caravaggio. He has started to look into the mirror. This is Rembrandt looking into the mirror. This is the face that looked out at himself. And this is the beginning of that communion with himself that lasts a lifetime, that almost clinical examination of his own features, which he did more, as far as I remember, more than 80 times. So that his face becomes, especially in the early work, the laboratory in which he experiments in the mysteries of expression, on the silent mind, which really is painting, and what it can convey. Once he wrote to a friend, and this is one of the few things we have from Rembrandt, he wrote, I try to express the maximum amount of inner emotion by outward movement. Here he is working in the mirror, making faces, and then trying to get into the mind behind the face. Rembrandt in a cat, open-mouthed and staring. That's the title of this one. And in all the changing faces, by the way, and the moving expressions and the distortions to which he subjects his own features, there is that great ridiculous nose. Look at it. It's unchanging. It's like a rock coming up out of the sea while the features change around it. And here again, by the way, is the attitude of surprise rather than surprise itself. And he's again studying the modes of expression in the face. And it is the Dutch face that expresses the emotion, just as Italian hands communicate and express. And remember, Rembrandt is never a great one for the dazzling gesture. He can make a face tell a whole story. And especially in his later work, gesture becomes almost uh, chastely classic in its lack of movement. It is the light that moves. The light becomes more eloquent than any gesture. Well, here he has been trying a catalogue of expressions that were to enter his repertoire for portraying the human drama. And he wanted to portray the human drama. This was his aim. And then he breeds into the expression, he breeds emotion and, and, and a golden light that gradually begins to fuse with the surface in which it strikes, that light does. 
so that eventually the light seems to come from within and not without. Now this is very interesting because do you see how introspective a man Rembrandt is? He's the supreme introspective. And you know, some of that seems to be happening here as you look at this, this light, this picture which was painted by the way uh, shortly before he left Leiden, probably. And this light in the forehead and this light in the face it's like the light seen at the end of a long tunnel as you're coming out of the subway. Do you ever notice the, the end of the tunnel and, and the light just streaming in? And this light is the same concentration and importance, the same quality of making one more aware of the surrounding darkness. And the closer you get to this, now this is, is going to be wonderful. Now the closer you get, you see how paint and light are becoming one and it's transformed into meaning. So that every square inch that Rembrandt paints seems an emanation of his own spirit. It's marvelous to see things as close as this. Look at that. You can see the very way the brush moved, and you can follow it with your hand and with your eye, and, and you feel the motion of the brush, and the little things he did with it. Here's one thing he did. He turned it upside down, took the handle, made a few slashes, a few little strokes there in the wet paint to turn out eyelashes. And this is tremendously exciting. It really is, because now you feel really in contact with a great man. He's communicating with you. And in no other artist is the means of expression, Rembrandt's means of expression, so intimately associated with what he actually expresses. Well, now this is a nice picture, but I think really it is the components of Rembrandt's distinction rather than the distinction, because it's the young man looking at old age, and as I'm always saying, young people are very bloomy. It's old people who are gay. And later when Rembrandt comes to paint old age, when he himself is old, when he's looking out from the inside, these old heads of his seem to contain a very, oh, a little world, a, a cosmos of sympathy and understanding. Well, here he's painting just about before he left Leiden, and before he goes to Amsterdam to test himself against his peers. He's an ambitious boy. He's really ambitious. And he wants to be a great historical painter. That's a truly Baroque ambition. Well, now let's pause here for a moment and see what he brings with him. He brings with him a great talent and a wonderful capacity already for handling light, as you saw here. His light early on is, you know, falls a little like a blow, but then gradually he refines and refines it until his light falls as softly as a moth. And early on especially is influenced by a man who was one of the great Bohemians in art, a man who lets light all like that blow we spoke about, and that, of course, is Caravaggio. And how often, again and again, we come back to Caravaggio. This man who seems to be the, the beginnings of the Baroque, so much of the Baroque come out of that style where figures gesture and spiral and move and hand on the gesture one to the other, so to make tremendous rhythmic patterns in three dimensions. The Baroque which succeeds the, the uneasy style of mannerism. Mannerism is full of doubts, just as the Reformation is full of doubts. And just as the Baroque succeeds the ma mannerist style, so do the certainties of those who are for or against succeed the Reformation. The Baroque is sure of itself. Well, now this light of Caravaggio's is exploited a few miles away in Utrecht. It's wonderful all these little towns, Utrecht, Harlem, Leiden, all together, and these great painters in them. It's exploited in Utrecht, and of course Rembrandt is aware of what they're doing. Over in Harlem, they're painting realistically. That's where Franz Hals is. In Amsterdam, the theme is the great historical picture, and Rembrandt, as we said, wants to be a great historical painter, so he goes to Amsterdam. And his first picture is what we would call a smash hit. Rembrandt's in, and his connection's there already, and he gets on very well, because he marries a relative of his dealer, Saskia. She's a beautiful young girl. She's money, and she loves him, and he loves her. And what more can you want? Well now, this is the beginning of a period in Rembrandt's life which I love to call the Roaring Thirties, the period from about oh, 1632 to 1642. And in this, everything goes right for Rembrandt, nothing goes wrong. And you'll find him at the auctions, buying from the dealers, making the beginnings of that wonderful collection of his, and he's showered with commissions as well. Showered with commissions. Now, this is a young genius. So how does he keep from butt boiling? Let's have a look. Is this a pot boiler? How about that? It's wonderful. It's wonderful. And this is a face painted with, with dignity and solidity. It's felt all the way. Feeling, feeling is in this. And this young man of 28, he, he is a real pro. 
That oval frame, by the way, that we just glided in by is very common in the 30s. And this lady is just a simple statement, simply, directly, a young woman with a pleasantness about her eyes. You know, Rembrandt's eyes often are lidded. I always notice the lids. You can always see the lids in his art, like, like Charles Boyer's eyes, you know? Well, here is that wonderful face, and it's shiny like the pearls around her neck. And that head is on top of a wonderful shining umbrella of lace. Look at it. It's a joy to look at it because it was a joy for him to paint it. And this face, you know, it goes remarkably deep for a man who's just rapidly fulfilling one of his many commissions. There's a warm flush of light on the flesh. And the colors seem to appear and disappear as you look at it. It's wonderful. He's felt the face and felt into it so much that you can feel the pressure of the lips. Look at that pressure of the lips as they rest one against the other and the moisture on them. But he has simplified. It's not realistic in a way because he's simplified an immense amount to give through art an illusion of reality. His light has washed the face clean, leaving only the essentials. And the essentials, as you see there, they recreate a living person whose image involves us. And so does this person here. This is the companion portrait. And the light is more slanted here, and it falls obliquely across the face. And I don't think this is as fine for my money, even allowing for the fact that that shadow on the right hand of the face, right hand side, has suffered a little, by the way, since Rembrandt laid down the brush. But it's a Rembrandt. It's a Rembrandt, and he very rarely falls down on the job. He's always worth looking at. The line by a great master can say more than a finished canvas by someone else. You see, in this picture, there are two persons to please. There's the patron, the man looking at you now, and there's Rembrandt, the painter and the patron. Well, now, let's look behind the formal commission and come upon something in which the artist is merely pleasing himself. And it's around the same time as this, too. It's the early 30s. And what a miraculous little sketch this is. It's wonderful. Just look at it. The dog in the doghouse. And this is the sort of thing, this little incident, that catches Rembrandt's eye. Always in the drawing, you can see again and again the observation of some some very commonplace of domesticity, transformed into art by what can only be called interest or affection, never sentimentality. And he does it by just getting the essentials in that brown ink of his with the pen. A flick of the brush, and the atmosphere springs up all round it. And you are something that calls directly on our experience. You know, this is something that has an echo in ourselves, the dog in the doghouse there. And the next dog you see in a dog, I say, you look at it again. This changes your viewpoint a little. It's wonderful the way it's curled up with that comfortable twist to the body. Well, that's just a little glimpse over the young man's shoulder, a little glimpse between two formal commissions. And now we're going to show you a great commission, a great formal commission, where he's really stretching himself. And he's still 28. He was painting very well that year. That's the year he married. And it's also the year he painted the two great Rothschild portraits in Paris. Well, here we have a pair that he painted for a young man the same age as himself, a young man of 28. On the right, we have Mr. Johannes Ellison, and here is his wife on the left. The English people, English Dutch from Norwich in England, they're visiting their son, and he has the young Rembrandt painting. Now, standing here between man and wife, I think we'll go to the lady first. And, and how Rembrandt loves the dark. The darkness which encourages quietude and meditation. The fathering and all humbling darkness, as one poet called it. And out of this darkness, he can literally bring his thoughts to light. And you see how shadowed under this hat and lit from light reflected from the millstone rough comes the face of Maria Ellison. She's got a lace cap on under the hat, and you can just see it peep out like two tiny wings at her temples. Do you see that? Now, this man's instinct for character is infallible. See the way the face recedes a little from you. It's rather withdrawn. You have to go in after it, you know, go searching for it. And that, in its way, tells you what sort of a person she was. She appears passive, you know. You've got to go in after and see. She's passive, pleasantly so. While her husband's face is male and strong and powerful and fully lit, and it comes out at you and impresses you with its weight and its substance, and it stares at you coolly. Look at the way he looks at you. It's such an outgoing gaze that it's no longer you who are looking at him and searching into his character. But it's he who's looking at you. 
You see the subtleties with which he reveals character by varying the character of his lighting. Even so early as this, he has in that light of his a source of infinite possibility, a powerful instrument which is capable above all of creating a wide variety of moods. And his range is as wide as has been said of, as Shakespeare's. And his deepest revelations, they seem to come with faces that are in repose, as here, so that the, 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 the expression becomes neutral, like a pane of glass, through which we look into the mind behind, which he always wanted to do. Now let's have a look at some brilliant painting. What do you think of that? Look at it. It's wonderful. It's carelessly and casually brilliant. It's broadly done, tossed off with a few strokes. It reminds you of, of a rough by hells, doesn't it? And it's just a joy to look at, because again, it was a joy for him to paint it. And it's there for a reason, you know, because if this wasn't here, this shadow down here would become far too opaque. And so he puts this in here, and it brings the figure out, and it also makes one aware of those other lighted spots, head and hand. And this is the center, and the others go out from it. You see, here's a man thinking all the time. And I think it was Degas who said that a picture demands as much cunning and subterfuge as the perpetration of a crime. Now here's the young man, 28, into those roaring thirties we talked about that end in 1642 as much as they do in any day. When his wife dies, that beautiful wife of his dies, and he paints the night watch, that was his most baroque painting, and then begins one of the most extraordinary things in the history of art. For Rembrandt withdraws. He withdraws into himself. And the townspeople now passing his window or his studio, they see the light lighting at night, and they begin to call him the owl. Rembrandt becomes the owl. Well, now, this journey into himself, he gains a compassion through his own spirit and beyond it that seems as wide as the world, that seems to encompass everything. You see, searching in his own spirit, he discovers the guarded man. Through man, he goes to God. Now, that's very different from the Italians who discover man from God, from the ideal. They go to man. And that illustrates two attitudes of mind, and it illustrates two religions as well. Because remember, Rembrandt is the great Protestant painter, and he makes the Bible relevant to every act in our daily lives, and that is the particular glory of Rembrandt and of Protestantism. Well, now this wonderful sympathy of his is a warming thing. It really is. And his art, I often think, is like a great continent in which the poor, and the humble, and the lowly, and the persecuted are allowed their full dignity as human beings, which many of us don't often do, because you see in, in Rembrandt's art, there are no color bars, and there are no reserved areas. His later art, the last 10 or 15 years of it, seem often to me to have a stillness about them, so that in a way, these years can be described as a classic pause in European art between the Baroque and the Rococo. Now, I have only a few other things to show you, but they strike deeper than anything we have already seen. And I think nothing explains this journey of Rembrandt into his own spirit so much as the fact that he etched, sketched, or painted himself more than 80 times. Now, this is not conceit. And I think it's best explained by something that Nietzsche said, when he said that each man is to himself the remotest of beings. Here is Rembrandt. He's now 42, and his face is in shadow. And his face is all the lack of emphasis, the lack of drama and expression as a person who says, here I am, and that's it. The fact of this face, the fact silences us. There's, no, there's nothing more to be said. I've always loved this etching, the dark face, the window open to the light and air, and the raised angle of the book which cues your light inward, cues your eye inward, I mean. And then you are made free of the space where Rembrandt sits. It's marvelous. It really is. It's wonderful. And here is the miracle of art that calls to the deepest places in our hearts. You see, the work of art is an experience, and after seeing this, we are changed and different in some way, in some, even in the smallest way. And now from the landscape of the individual heart. 
we go to the open landscape of Holland under a sky just clearing of rain. It's the three trees standing up there against the sky. And it may be his best known etching. And I wanted you to see it because I want you to see how his light is held in his etching as well as in the painting. And to show you something more, the tremendous skill with which he does this. And we'll look into the infinitude of strokes made by the needle to produce this effect. This distance, this air, this sky which expands with light. Look at the way he handles the needle in this. He's like a great virtuoso on a violin. And, and the density of each stroke, the depth, the direction of it varies. And then here and there the enmesh and a little flurry. And they're all, all the time controlled to produce an effect, a, a summary of nature, which amounts to a symbol of natural truths. A symbol of natural truths which are revealed through application and affection. Well now, we've kept the good wine until last. And I've had this masterpiece up my sleeve all the time. And he painted this when he was about 60. And in a way, it is a climax in contemplation. A climax in that journey into his own spirit. And now here's something that's I, I really want you to, to know, and it's difficult to get across, because I feel that in Rembrandt's art, there, there is a tremendous unity. Man is brought into a unity which all of us need, because in him, the sensual is illuminated by the spiritual. And the spiritual is truly warmed by the sensual. Man is one. And here are the rich, final textures of that integration. There's a wonderful warp and a whoop here, which creates Oh, a, a living texture of darkness. And out of it comes that face, that wonderful face. It's tremendous. Really marvelous. Do you see the way the eyes are downcast there? They're veiled in thought and surrounded by the movement of shadows there. Well, now, in this light, as in the last great work of Rembrandt, there's a final distillation of feeling. And this has a quality, this light, that I can only call blooming. As you look at it, it's growing and growing. It's suffusing your vision until you are drawn into a golden haze, a, a warm and richly mellow atmosphere where one is aware of warmth and humanity and a broader sympathy than which we are commonly capable. And then we realize we are in a different world. We're in the world created by Rembrandt. And this world can truly change our lives in some small way as we experience it more deeply. In 1669, Rembrandt died. He was aged 63. His pictures remain here with us. And there are messages from him, personal messages, because he has signed them as one would sign a letter to a friend with his first name. Not Rembrandt van Rijn, but Rembrandt, like Vincent, to you and to me. <laughs>